About 15 years ago, I was called upon by the Chennai chapter of Intac to assist them and the Madras University in the repair of their historic building, the Senate House. The building was in shambles when we took it up for repair. The task was extremely challenging. It was challenging because in the first principles of conservation, we have to restore each and every building component like for like using the very same materials and methods as was used in the, in the 1800s. Now, where do I look for such material? Because in all the five years of my architectural training, or in the year that I did my conservation, I have never come across any material that talks of, of what we did maybe 100 or 200 years ago. I'd like to place before you two aspects of the conservation that were extremely interesting and that had a lasting impact. One was the uh, use of very highly polished lime, lime plasters including in the walls within the very same building that you're sitting in now, but we don't see. And the second is embossed patterns using the very same, with the very same material, which is lime. I tried to you know, go through several books, accounts. Much was written in the, in the 1800s, mostly by the white man. And much was spoken about this fabulous technique of plastering. But there were no details, because the recipe was not similar across, across the continent or across uh, uh, at least the subcontinent. Yeah. Anything from whey water to ghee to milk to coconut milk to some, and, and sometimes they say even blood was added to, to the lime plaster to allow it to achieve its required consistency. What did help us was actually the knowledge of coupled with the knowledge of what I had read in my books by, as part of the research, was also the knowledge of what we would term laymen or, you know, uh, very normal masons who had ha one old person who had handled this when he was 30 years old and how he's 80, but he's, he's just plastered a wall with lime. So countless discussions with him, finally, I, we were able to, you know, identify that the plaster had to be laid in several layers. They had to be burnished or polished using very soft stones or pebbles, and they had to be powdered down using talc, which goes into making talcum powder. And the final finish was sh shown like mirror. The technique was called Madras plaster, and that, that was the name given by the white man. Probably there were different names to it in different places, but we had never heard of it in our academic learning. Uniquely, the walls of the Senate House were also colored. And unlike paint that is today applied on the walls, they used a lot of soft stones that were ground to a fine paste and mixed and ground and mixed in different ways and sieved in different ways to get a final finish like this. All of this was not all in, in the Senate House. There were a large number of patterns that filled the walls of the Great Hall, which was, which was the central space of the Senate House, and the domes on the exterior. These patterns were called scraffito, and this, this, the name again came through my research, and nobody had heard of it. These patterns had to be layered one above the other. Yeah. And, it, and at, at a height of 200 feet above the ground, with the wind blowing, we had to work out our own methods of doing it. But what resulted was an absolute sort of stupefying effect, and the entire credit went to the people who worked on it. And I should say that there was, an, there was a kind of a spiritual transformation amongst them because so far they had just been pushed into doing work that they didn't like and now they were so proud of what they had turned out and they would go into discussions, lengthy discussions over minute details. I've also done other buildings. Of late I'm doing a tiny mosque in Abhiramam. And 
I have done the WCC, the science block of the WCC college, and a parsonage in Ecard. Now, all of these buildings are not as exotic as the Senate House. They require interventions which are largely structural to stabilize them from falling apart. Ecard, for example, involved resurrecting an entire Madras terrace roof, again another technique that was lost. What are the lessons that we learn from this? We all know that as being a conservation architect and that being my job and conservation be being the sort of the need of the day to day, that it is sustainable, that it is more labor intensive, it uses natural materials and it helps in reviving several traditional ways of building and craftsmanship. But can I just be satisfied with the lessons that, have that I have learned from this? So how have I contributed in, in, in sort of passing on these lessons to a larger society? This brings up very important questions. The most important being, where is our heritage, our, our, bo our body of heritage that we are going to leave to the future? And what is our responsibility in building in a sustainable fashion, just as they built earlier? And why do we continue to do such things when we uh, continue to build in an unsustainable fashion when we realize that there are more sustainable ways of doing so. Buildings like the Senate House were built as power statements and we had no control over their erection or their conservation. But we do have control over our dwellings, over our immediate environment and the broader environment. And if we need to make a difference then we do have to, make, to get into the action of looking at where we can start making that difference. For this, the best place to actually look for is what is our true heritage, which we in architectural terms call the vernacular. The vernacular buildings are those that fill the small villages and towns of India. They were built absolutely to context. They respected their, uh, you know, their, their, their physical, their geography, their geology, their hydrology, and they were totally intertwined with them. I'll just take you through a, a description of Abhiramam where I've had the opportunity to interact with its people over the last two years in, in the mosque renovation that I'm doing there, consisting of about maybe 2,000 houses. Abhiramam has a very large water body called the Kanmai. I'd never heard this word before. And it is so large because it's a drought prone area and the Kanmai gathers a lot of water, meant for agriculture, and there's another smaller water body and several other smaller water bodies for human use. The, and the Kanmai is, uh, is probably about 10 times the size of the town itself. The, the town looks extremely dense, but there are enough open spaces with its courtyards, courtyards within the houses, courtyards within prayer areas, and of course, the ponds add a large, to a large extent to the open space. There are open spaces for animals. There are groves. And most importantly, there are trees, which are not just landscape or visual elements that follow the first world elements of design. They are trees of utility. There are markets, which are small, which breed familiarity. There are streets which encourage travel by light vehicles, foot, and there are buildings which reflect the life experiences of their people. This mosque didn't even look like a mosque, and this is also one more. They were erstwhile traders from Burma, and they had borrowed much of their building inspiration from there. Their houses, built both for the traders who were the wealthy ones, lay al alongside the more simpler ones that were just plain lime washed. There were numerous verandas that allowed for interaction of all shapes and colors. And there was the essential courtyard within the house, which allowed for outdoor activity within the house. And there were a new, there were a number of spaces for conversation, as we can see. My question is that if we were to translate this true heritage of ours into 
in a setting for where we now live, would we not then result with a blueprint of a truly smart city? This city would have small parcels of land, and dwelling units would be restricted to maybe three or four floors. The reason that we could handle water, waste, and energy in a sustainable fashion. There would be equal space for the underprivileged who make the lives of the privileged work. And there, the spaces for work, study, would be interlinked with the houses to enable us to be able to move around easily and comfortably. We should be surrounded by the water and the food that we produce, that we consume, and we should be responsible for its production rather than just be consum uh, consumers at the end of the day. And if we could build with natural materials like stone and brick, which is still available, then we would truly have a place that is filled with a sense of place and memories that our children will be able to carry forward. This is not a dream. This, is not, this need not be utopian. We just have to strive to keep the, the settings around our city intact without spreading humongously and merging into one large sort of, you know, sprawling octopus. If we all work towards that, as we are now working towards conserving our water bodies, then this will not remain something on paper. It can become reality. Thank you.